He heads the Lions Lab. Uh, lab. <coughs> I, I was trying to remember the entire uh, expansion of the abbreviation, but it's a lab for intelligent uh, integrated networks of engineering systems, which I think is becoming increasingly important nowadays as cars are integrations of many different subsystems, um, smart cities, buildings, everything is becoming an integration of many different subsystems. Amru got his undergraduate degree and his master's degree from MIT, not too far away. His PhD, he decided he should skip across the pond and get from the University of Cambridge. And more recently, he's published this book uh, on a heterofunctional graph model for city structures, uh, for smart city infrastructure. And so he's going to be talking to us about this very new work. I understand one of his students, who's also a co-author of the book, is here, Wester. So welcome to you as well. And Amro, over to you. Look forward to it. OK, great. So, and um, I'll hand the book back to yeah. you as opposed to walk away. Yeah, if you guys ask really tough questions, I might refer to the, uh, to the book. Um, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm really happy to be talking about it uh, today. And um, Wester was the, the first author on this, uh, this book, and also uh, Professor Nesrael, who's at the Geisel School of uh, Medicine, uh, has helped author the, author the book as well. So let me, um, by way of introduction, uh, tell you a little bit about our, our lab and the types of problems we look at. So um, certainly, um, a, a lot of people are working on cyber physical systems of, of different types that you will have some sort of physical system being uh, controlled, planned, and operated by uh, some sort of controller or decision making entity, human or automated or otherwise. And, um, and that's all good and all, but, and certainly the electric power grid is a really good example of that. But what happens if we start to recognize that there is another physical system? Uh, that is maybe controlled by an entirely different entity, and that these two are now going to work together. And um, this is not exactly an easy problem, and certainly for engineers who are oftentimes trained in silos of, let's say, transportation or water or civil or mechanical or electrical engineering, certainly we don't do that at the Thayer School of Engineering, uh, but that is very much the norm. It leads us to siloed thinking, and it does not allow us to really tackle a lot of the emerging problems that uh, we see. And so the Lions has actually dedicated itself to quite a few different problems that fit to this sort of class, and smart power grids with communication and um, uh, electric power grids is certainly an example. But I've also worked on the energy water nexus, electrified transportation systems, uh, industrial energy management, and then if you have worked in that many different physical systems, you might want to say, well, what happens if we try and put it all together into an interdependent smart city infrastructure work? And that's really where this book uh, shows a convergence of our, of our research. Uh, I've left here the presentation abstract so that when you guys have access to the written copy or the electronic copy, it's uh, here. So what I really want to do is talk about smart cities as a grand challenge talk about the need for heterofunctional graph theory, it's just some preliminary concepts for uh, before I get right into it, uh, chapter four of the heterofunctional graph theory, then try and give a, um, an example, uh, sort of smart city, and then uh, talk about some of the other places where we've used, um, uh, uh, used this work, and then conclude. Um, uh, I believe in, I believe the, the DOD calls it bluff, bottom line up front. Um, and so really the contribution of heterofunctional graph theory is, um, is that it could be applied to interdependent infrastructure systems of arbitrary topology. The theory is extensible in the number of physical elements and functions within the city. It can accommodate many, uh, it can accommodate many infrastructure systems as required in, in the analysis so you can determine uh, what you need. Um, and it's fundamentally about systems with directed graphs. And a lot of network science really is um, you know, purely about under, undirected graphs. This is really about directed graphs. And it's fundamentally cyber, uh, cyber physical. So today, what we're going to look at is a presentation that covers the seven mathematical elements of heterofunctional uh, graph theory. And um, this is very much a tutorial nature, although I won't be able to you know, cover everything in the book. 
Um, as we go through, we really use two uh, examples to talk about uh, heterofunctional graph theory. One is very simple of a four node system or what we can sort of um, naively call uh, four nodes with a water treatment facility, a uh, solar PV facility, a, uh, a house, and, um, and a work location. And then a much more involved uh, interdependent infrastructure, we call it Trimetrica, um, which has an electric power system in the middle, um, a uh, electrified water distribution system, as most water distribution systems are, and, um, and then finally an electrified transportation system. And so I would like to start out with a very pressing question. If, if my city had you know, these three infrastructures, how might I start thinking about the resilience of that city's infrastructures? How might I start thinking about the sustainability? And I don't mean the resilience of one of the infrastructures, as is oftentimes done, you know, just the physical grid or just our water system, but rather the integrated whole. And so what we're going to need is an approach that somehow marries these three systems together in some quantitative way. And that's really um, where heterofunctional graph theory gets um, its practical motivation. So just take a moment to talk about smart cities. Um, some of you may or may not know that this is a big problem, and it's only going to get bigger. Um, we have a massive trend towards urbanization. Um, our global population is certainly growing. Um, and then 55% of people living in urban areas, adding another 2.5 billion by 2050. And that's not showing too well uh, here. But uh, the, the issue is that in addition to, that, uh, to this uh, population gr growth and urbanization, we also have a need for massive change of architecture as well in the form of uh, deep decarbonization. So um, there have been a number of different research thrusts uh, recently. One is interdependent infrastructure systems. It's mentioned in um, uh, Obama's uh, present Presidential Pol Policy Directive 21. Um, there is, we can look at smart cities from the perspective of people and society as well. And uh, some people have been looking at trying to develop, quote unquote, utopian visions of what a smart city actually is. And then, of course, a good portion of smart cities is really about governance and transparency and how, how can citizens engage um, their smart cities effectively. Um, and this corresponds closely to uh, what we hear about with Internet of Things, Internet of Services, and Internet of People. Uh, certainly, big data analytics has an important role that as you develop these models and as you develop sensors across these um, you know, uh, many aspects of a city, you will be generating a great deal of, of data. But it's not just about uh, data analytics, because big data, in our mind, needs to match with really big new theory. And, and, and we feel that we're on our way to um, uh, you know, making contributions in that area. So let's talk about heterofunctional uh, graph theory and the need for it. So um, recently, uh, how many of you have heard of multi-layered networks? Just show of hands. OK. So um, re recently, um, Kavela and others have published a review of the multi-layer network uh, literature. And uh, if you read that you know, uh, review, it has about 500 different references. It's excellently uh, written comes to a very striking conclusion, which is that if you look at all of the multi-layer network literature, you will find that all of them exhibit one or more modeling constraints, um, and, um, and that th th these constraints really prevent them from looking at sort of real world systems. And what are those types of constraints? Well, there is alignment of nodes between layers. Uh, disjointment between layers, equal number of nodes for all layers, exclusively vertical couplings between layers, equal couplings between layers, node counterparts are coupled between all layers, uh, a limited number of modeled layers, maybe only two or maybe only three, and a limited number of aspects for each layer. 
And, um, and I'm not saying that all multilayer networks, uh, and certainly this is not my statement, all multilayer networks exhibit all of these constraints. Rather, the, the literature as a whole, every element of that, uh, of that set exhibits one, at least one of these constraints. And, um, and so what we did was we said, well, can we come up with like a fictitious example, this system here, um, as small as we could possibly uh, make it, that exhibits all of these uh, uh, different constraints? Um, because what that means is that the multilayer network literature would not be able to model this, uh, uh, this system in its entirety. Um, and so um, if we take each of these constraints and just give them a little bit of time, um, some multi-layer -net networks require all layers to have vertically aligned uh, nodes. And in figure 2.1, however, V4 is not connected to V7, so uh, here and, and there. Um, another constraint, some multi-layer networks require disjoint layers, but if you look here at uh, V3, it pertains to both the electrical layer as well as the transportation layer. It's a, a, it's a charging station, I believe. Um, Constraint three, some multilayer networks require the same number of nodes in each layer. Well, uh, if we look here, uh, the water network has three nodes while the transportation network has four. Another constraint, uh, some multilayer networks require exclusively vertical cross-layer couplings. Um, V10 is not a counterpart of V5. So if we look at V5, it has its counterpart here, V8, but it also has this other uh, cross-layer connection to, to V10. Some multilayer networks require that all nodes in a given layer have identical couplings uh, to nodes in another layer. Um, but we could look here at V1 and V5. They, they're connected, but V4 and V7 are, are not. Some multilayer networks require that each node is connected to all of its counterparts. Um, uh, however, in, uh, uh, nodes V2 and V4 are not connected to uh, other layers. So you know, V2 here or V4, or V4 there they're not actually connected to another layer. Constraint seven, uh, a limited number of layers to, uh, to two. Well, in this example, we have, uh, we have three. Um, and um, finally, some multilayer uh, networks require that each layer have no more than one aspect um, in, in the sense that um, oftentimes the edges are represented by features or a, a single parameter, uh, if you will. And uh, certainly in the case of like tra transportation, uh, you could be moving all sorts of different types of uh, operands, whether it's vehicles or buses or pedestrians or, or, or so forth. So, um, and uh, I'll, I'll cut to the chase by telling you that the appendix of the book uses heterofunctional graph theory to model this particular, uh, this particular example um, uh, as a demonstration of its uh, modeling power. So before I get into the theory itself, I want to make sure that I'm speaking from the same set of concepts um, that we uh, can build off of. Naturally, I need to say something about graph theory. Uh, we can take this very simple uh, directed graph and write down its incidence uh, ma matrix. We have our nodes on the columns, and we have our uh, edges, um, sorry, on the rows, and the, and the edges on the, uh, on the columns, and indicating the relationship between nodes uh, nodes and edges, and then we have an adjacency matrix showing the relationship between the three nodes that are, are represented here. The other thing I would like to talk about is really the importance of systems thinking. And this is something I emphasize in pretty much every single one of my classes, including the, um, the, the core uh, linear dynamic systems class that uh, sophomores and juniors at Thayer, Thayer take. When we look at the world, we can look at the world as in terms of its physical nature. And oftentimes, we're very concerned as uh, engineers, as mathematicians, computer scientists, of developing mathematical models that will give us some sort of mathematical insight. But that process is not a process that happens directly. We have to recognize that it actually happens through modeling, and actually, mo first and foremost, that there is a system thinking abstract process that happens within the mind that helps to organize our thinking and transfer from that physical system over to the, math the mathematical system. And certainly, uh, systems, uh, the systems engineering field has emphasized this 
with uh, what we call systems thinking. It's also apparent in the uh, ontological uh, sciences. And if we look here, we can see a little bit more, more carefully what, what really happens in that you can have a, a real domain that is uh, um, that th there's, a, there's, a real, there's a, a real domain that, uh, that describes maybe things like electric power systems. We can conceptualize it, and then we might have some sort of language that describes it. We can take all of this and instantiate it to look at some sort of physical object um, or physical system, let's say the, um, the electric power grid in the city of Lebanon. And, um, and then that means that there's going to be some sort of abstraction uh, of that and, uh, and a model. Now, when we start talking about this process of uh, the abstraction, which will exist in the mind, and the model itself, which will exist as, you know, whether it's a graphical model or a quantitative mathematical model, we need to have ensure some coherence between uh, that abstraction that exists in the mind and uh, the actual mathematical model itself. And the ontological sciences have um, found ways to describe this uh, analytically, if you will, in terms of four uh, different prop uh, properties, soundness, completeness, lucidity, and, uh, and lacunicity. By the way, if you adhere to all four, then your model faithfully represents your abstraction and vice versa. You'll get a one-to-one -one mapping between what is basically going on in your mind and uh, and the mathematical uh, and the mathematical model. Well, um, what do these four properties mean? Well, for soundness, every modeling primitive in the language has an interpretation in the abstraction as a domain uh, abstraction as an A, and you can have the absence of it would look like uh, what we see in C. Uh, completeness, every concept in the abstraction is represented by a modeling uh, primitive as in B over here, and it's uh, um, absence would appear in, in D. Lucidity is every modeling primitive in the language represents one domain concept in the abstraction as in C, and the absence of it would look like A. And then laconicity would have every concept in the abstraction is rep rep represented at most once in the model as in D, and um, the absence of it causes redundant modeling pri uh, primitives as in, in B. Well, why is this important, and how does it relate to this simple example that I just gave? And if you were to really work through it carefully, you would end up finding out that in terms of these four properties, the multilayer network uh, literature lacks completeness. Uh, the set of mathematical modeling elements is insufficient to represent all the conceptual elements in the abstraction. And lucidity is also not maintained because not all conce conceptual elements in the abstraction have unique representations in the mathematical model. So what we're going to need is, going, is a theory that is, or a modeling theory that is rich enough to uh, represent all of these different types of abstractions that we have. Um, just want to mention the field of uh, model-based systems engineering, its formal uh, definition, and one of the things that it uses to uh, capture uh, how we represent systems is the systems modeling language. I'm speaking to a computer science uh, audience. Uh, SysML uh, really is, in many ways, a derivative of uh, UML, the Unified Modeling Language, which is integral to many software engineering development processes. Um, if you just took everywhere where I wrote SysML and replaced it with UML, it would be, uh, you know, uh, still very much, uh, still very much applicable. And the the uh, graphical models that I present here um, are, are pretty much interchangeable with, uh, with UML models. There's just only minor changes in, in syntax. A few more quick concepts. I'll talk about instantiated architectures, reference architectures, and meta-architectures. And the best way to really understand uh, what I mean by these is really by, by way of example. So I can have a uh, electric power system that looks like this. It's a particular instance. It's an instantiated architecture. It's going to have a certain number of buses and lines and generators um, and electrified roads and so forth. It's an instance. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise. Underneath that or above uh, that uh, instantiated architecture, we can think about it in terms of a reference architecture. And again, if you are doing software engineering, instead of looking at instances, you would be looking at the level of classes. And so we might say 
um, in electric power systems that we have buses, generators, loads, and branches. By the way, not just nodes and edges as we might do in graph theory, but we would, we would make sure to have these four types of um, classes at a minimum. And we can also describe the functional behavior in general of how an electric power system uh, works. It tends to generate electric power by drawing in a fuel, and then it will transport the electric power uh, many times, potentially. And then eventually, it will get consumed, and there will be work or heat that comes out. Well, above that, we can also say that there are, um, there's a meta-architecture, and um, and the traditional graph theory that we're familiar with, with, with nodes and edges, is certainly an example of that. And heterofunctional graph theory will have to develop a meta-architecture that is applicable to something as broad as interdependent smart city uh, infrastructures. And I'll get to that in a few slides. The other thing I'm going to need to talk about is something called system concept. And in engineering, one of the things that we emphasize is that there might be some sort of designed artifact. It has its function, what it does, and it has its form, what it's made up of. Um, again, when we think of software engineering, we can think of classes, and we can think of the methods that those classes will end up doing. Uh, but we also need to think about it's the allocation of function to form. Um, and that is, becomes the, actually the most essential part of, of heterofunctional graph theory in that we need to understand what pieces of form do what things. And it's, it's that mapping that is the, the heart of heterofunctional graph theory. As I mentioned, heterofunctional graph theory has seven different types of modeling elements. And I won't go into all of them here, but um, I'll just jump right into it. So the first one was system concept which is what I was just talking about. <coughs> and we recall this small uh, four node example that includes a, a water treatment facility, a solar PV plant, a house, and a work location. And so if we think about its form, and we call form really about resources, we use this term system resources, we will say that, um, and, and now I'm talking about the meta architecture underlying heterofunctional graph theory, there will be a set of resources and there will be also transportation resources, things that are responsible for moving some sort of operand from one place to another, and then um, buffers, which tend to hold it in place. And those have two different types. One that will simply, independent buffers, simply hold it in place, but others that will not just hold it in place, but transform the nature of that operand in some way uh, or another, like a power plant, for example. And so, we have our set of transportation, uh, transformation resources, independent buffers, and transportation resources. We could also think about how um, the, the processes or the functions that exist within a given system, and again, we look, we're talking at the level of a meta-architecture, that some sort of input operand will cross the system boundary. We assume an open system by, by default, rather than assuming a closed system, and that it could potentially be transformed, and then it will be uh, transported, and, and, and implicit to transporting it is that it will be carried along the way. Um, and then it can come back and uh, potentially be transformed again or be transported uh, again. And so the way we look at this is that the system processes um, will, ha will have our set of transformation processes and a set of transportation uh, processes. We'll start out by just simply saying that the transportation processes are between uh, some uh, origin y1 and some origin y, y2, which means that there's by default uh, n squared of, uh, of them. But we actually need to refine, uh, refine that uh, definition. In that holding processes, the idea of carrying an operand while it's being transported can actually differentiate between the different types of processes that we have. And so we're going to um, think about differentiating transportation processes on the base, basis of, of their holding process in that it can carry different things from one place to another, right? Um, let's say I have, I was just talking to Dakota about pipelines from one city to another. I might have an oil pipeline, but I might also have a natural gas pipeline. And I have to differentiate between those two processes. I, I can have a, um, I can hold a given operand in one way, and so, <coughs> 
it's quite <clears throat> useful right now for me to hold this bottle of water um, along its circumference. But um, you can also imagine carrying it axially as well. And that's uh, particularly important if you start thinking about fixturing and manufacturing systems amongst other types of systems. And then finally, changing the state of an operand, because that pipeline um, m might have held water and moving from one location to, to the next. Or um, we might be surprised to find out that at the outlet of that pipe, uh, water is not coming out, but rather steam. Um, as we see in, uh, uh, in, let's say, district heating systems. And so refined transportation processes crosses uh, these holding processes with the uh, transportation processes that are only destination-based. So that gets us to the notion of system concept. And we use a lot of different terms to talk about system concept or the elements of system concept um, in the manufacturing literature, we oftentimes talk about them, uh, or the uh, sort of uh, business organizational management, we talk about them in terms of capabilities. Um, within the book, we call them degrees of freedom. There's a really good reason for that, because they map very well to uh, robotics, mechanical uh, degrees of freedom. And what we will do is we, we have this thing called a, a design equation, uh, and it has this bipartite graph here where along the, along the rows, uh, we will have all of the different processes, and along the columns, we'll have the, all the different resources. And what we want to know is what resource does what, right? And um, again, for systems engineers and software engineers, this is not a, a surprise. We can talk about our uh, resources here, having the ability to transport or hold some sort of operand, and transformation resources having the ability to transform. Uh, an operand. And so this is one way of representing the system concept in, uh, in software engineering, and this is how you would do it uh, mathematically. We can also look at it from uh, the lens of function within activity diagrams, whether it's UML or, or SysML. And so here, this transformation uh, uh, process is being done by a transformation resource within a swim lane, or we can have all of the different resources have the potential for uh, transporting, even if that means uh, storing it in, in the same place. And so we introduce this notion of a structural degree of freedom, which is the set of independent actions that completely define the available processes in this large flexible engineering uh, system. How many of these different combinations of form and function are these uh, individual degrees of freedom? They will exist within this JS uh, knowledge base uh, matrix, but we also want to introduce the notion that that capability does not just exist, but it may also be available or not, in, in the sense that you know, I might take a power uh, uh, a generation facility offline, or I might want to take a machine offline. And so I can introduce constraints in time that will allow for that. And in the end, we have our system concept here, that represents the, uh, the, the system concept. So what does that look like for our very simple example here? Um, we can think of our smart city model. We have our meta architecture, which includes our transportation resources, our transformation resources, and our independent buffers. And we have here, by the way, this is representing the, the, instantiated, uh, the instantiated version of this as, uh, uh, as, a, as a UML or SysML class diagram. Uh, and we have our power lines, our water pipeline, and our road, our house, our water treatment facility. And we also have the methods or the system processes that each of these things can do. If you look carefully, we're now going to end up with, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this is looking at it from the form lens. Uh, and then we can also look at it from the functional lens, that the water treatment facility will treat water, and then that will take it to a wider water pipeline that transports potable water and, and so forth. And you can see the, the full sort of holistic behavior of this very simple uh, example. So what we're going to do, and this is very different than what we're accustomed to in, in regular graph theory, is that we're going to assign a node for every structural degree of freedom. Right? So here, whereas we had four nodes all representing effectively resources or elements of form. Now what we have is 
nodes that represent this capability or this notion that uh, a particular resource can do something. And uh, it's fairly easy to follow in that we have uh, you know, this yellow X here representing um, our solar PV uh, plant. We have this uh, blue X here representing our um, water treatment facility. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have three different processes that, are, that the house uh, can do and, and one with a work location. Now, another thing that is very different in terms of how we define nodes in a heterofunctional graph versus uh, a traditional graph is that there are also nodes associated with the ability to transport an operand because they have indeed a capability or um, a, a, a degree of freedom associated with them. And that's what appears here in, uh, in, in the black. So, that leads you to, well, all I've done now is just to find my nodes in a very uh, sort of rigorous way. I'm going to want to connect them with an adjacency matrix. And so how do I go about doing that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, our uh, knowledge base and constraints matrix, or our system concept. I'm going to vectorize uh, that matrix and do an outer uh, product. And I'm, this is going to give me what's called a system sequence uh, knowledge base. And then I'm going to have to introduce constraints between the various nodes. And those constraints are really of two different types. Well, the first is sort of a set of perpetual sort of uh, physics abiding uh, continuity constraints that basically say that if I'm going to have one transformation followed by another transformation uh, at a certain location, then it must be at that same location. I, um, if, if I were to do a transformation followed by a, a, another transformation, uh, at a different place, then it implies that I moved it first, right? So, um, and, and so I need to make sure that I um, apply constraints uh, of that nature. And then similarly, uh, if I were to do a trans transportation process, then, um, then the destination of that transportation process um, could be followed by uh, a transformation process in that same location. Um, and then you can say the same thing, where I have a transformation that occurs at a certain location, and then the origin of the transportation process must be the same as where I did the transformation. And then finally, that from uh, if two transportation processes followed by, uh, follow each other, then the uh, the destination of the uh, of the of the former is the same as the origin of the latter. So you have to apply these constraints. But you also have to apply another set of constraints that are particular to your particular application, right? And, um, and so I take the example of an electric power system in that it generates electric power, then it transports electricity, and then it, and then it consumes it. I can do a whole bunch of transportations in the process, but what I can't do is consume electric power and then generate it. That doesn't make physical laws of sense. And, and so as I uh, develop the uh, the graph, I need to take into account this underlying reference architecture uh, or design pattern. So these types of constraints are en end up being captured in this uh, sequence dependent uh, constraints matrix, and it get, ends up giving me this heterofunctional uh, adjacency matrix in the end. And as you would expect, that matrix is particularly, uh, particularly sparse, and oftentimes you would uh, you would need to project it down to eliminate some of the uh, some of the sparsity. We call the uh, we call the edges in that adjacency matrix uh, sequence dependent degrees of freedom, whereas the nodes would be called structural or sequence independent uh, degrees of freedom. So if you follow all of that, then what what ends up happening is that we can take this system. There were four nodes here, but there were eleven degrees of freedom. Uh, if you count them all, and then the green lines are now going to show the ability of one degree of freedom to follow another, um, uh, or one capability to, to follow another in a, in a very directed sense. Heterofunctional graph theory will always have a system concept and will always have a heterofunctional adjacency matrix, but oftentimes it's really important to think about what is going on physically in our engineering system, but also think about what's happening, happening informatically. Are there control processes? Are there decision-making processes? And, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we captured uh, the presence of 
controllers. And so the controller agency matrix is really about the jurisdiction of controllers over resources. What do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes we see all sorts of centralized systems which might have a number of resources, and each of those resources have the ability to do various things. And we might superimpose some controller, some manager, that will oversee all of those different resources. We call that a centralized controller or a centralized control system. But what we can also imagine is we can have a distributed system um, that where, you know, uh, let's say there is a controller that is only governing the processes of this one resource or another controller that is governing the processes of, the, of these resources. And, and maybe the, you know, we'll get to that, but the, the controllers will be able to speak to each other. The controller adjacency matrix, uh, sorry, the controller agency matrix shows the agency of a given controller over certain, uh, certain resources. And as you would expect, it's a bi bipartite uh, graph. And so in our meta architecture, uh, we had all of our physical resources here. We're going to introduce these cyber uh, resources that have the ability to make some sort of decision making or control capability of some kind. And in our example, what we're going to do is here is uh, introduce a water utility, uh, Q1, and it's going to be able to look at the water treatment facility and the water pipeline. Uh, an electric power utility that is going to look at two power lines and a, uh, the solar PV plant. Um, and maybe an end user uh, who is uh, going to oversee this office location and, uh, and this house. And we want to make sure that our overall graph uh, captures both these uh, agency, controller agency interactions as well as the physical uh, interactions. We also need another matrix because we might have more than one, uh, one controller and the controllers might need to talk to each other. Um, and so we'll, we want to have something that captures the communication between controllers. Um, and this gets us to thinking about the different types of informatic interfaces that we tend to see in uh, engineering systems and certainly heterofunctional graph theory. We can have um, uh, two physical resources that are interfacing with each other, a type one uh, interface, which is a physical interface. Oftentimes, it, it uh, might include like transfers of power, um, which are fundamentally uh, uh, two-way in, in nature. We can also have this type two interface, a cyber physical interface between a physical resource and a cyber resource. And that's what I just uh, mentioned. That's really all about uh, agency. But then there's also, if I were to have, let's say two controllers, uh, there can be a communication between those two uh, controllers, this type three type of uh, interface, and we call that the controller adjacency uh, matrix. Um, and, uh, and really, it's as simple as that. And so here, what we have is our three cyber resources. And for the sake of simplicity, all of them are able to talk with each other, and uh, as shown in, in red. So we've brought about the notion of these physical resources. We've also thought of these informatic uh, entities that we're going to call them controllers or cyber resources. But there's another uh, issue that we really need to take into account, which is that the operands themselves have the potential to change state. I gave the example before that as I'm moving water, I might turn it into steam later. And if I don't capture that, then um, I'm really missing part of the uh, essential essence of the engineering system. And so we're going to use um, within uh, UML or SysML state machines. To do that, uh, we can have our treat water uh, and it becomes potable and then we consume it and then it no longer is. Um, we can generate electricity, it, it's now in the form of electricity and then, uh, and then once we consume it, it no longer is. Um, or um, we can think of a, a, a charging electric vehicle and it becomes in a charged state and then, uh, and then once it get, it's it, the, its charge is used, uh, and you discharge the EV, it no longer is. And, um, but we want to take this state machine UML type of representation and turn it into something that is quantitative. So what we're going to do is um, uh, very easily transform it into what are called um, petri nets. We call them service, um, service petri nets. And so you know, if I were to take simply these pictures and turn them into petri nets. If you're 
familiar with that uh, formalization, then you might say, oh, I have uh, potable water enters into the system. It will remain in this state. I might um, you know, uh, keep on maintaining it, give some sort of action to, to maintain it, and then it might leave that state entirely. Uh, electric power, same way here. It will remain within this electricity state. And uh, the electric vehicle within uh, being charged. This, is th this particular uh, representation is particularly important in manufacturing systems because the, the operand becomes the product. And if we want to talk about the evolution of the product from some sort of raw state to some work in progress to some final product and it gains value along the way, we want to make sure that we capture that. And these Petri nets, these service nets, uh, will allow us to do it. Since we're trying to build an overall single graph, it is useful to take this Petri net and say, oh, well, let's get rid of the places. The places don't mean so much to me in my, uh, my graph. So, um, so you, what you would do is you would take the incidence matrix of the Petri net um, and um, uh, the, the ingoing uh, incidence matrix and the outgoing incidence matrix and do a, an inner product. And then you would see how each transition is related uh, to another with sort of the, the places uh, removed. And so now we can call that a service graph for uh, the delivery of potable water, the delivery of electric power, and the delivery of electric vehicles. The sixth and penultimate matrix, before I get to the final system adjacency matrix, is a service feasibility matrix. And what we need to recognize is that the physical engineering system that is, let's say, generating electricity is, um, is, is doing its, its it one thing, but it's also happening in synchronization with the change of state of our uh, of our operand. And so what we need is a feasibility matrix that synchronizes uh, those activities uh, together. And so we, we create this feasibility matrix, as you would expect, it would be a, um, a, a, another form of bipartite uh, graph, one that links up uh, the feasibility of transformations to changes to um, the, the service uh, state, and the, another one for uh, service transportation feasibility. And I'm not going to get into the, the details of you know, the Chronicle product and, and why it looks the, the way it is. It, it's pretty well described in the, in the book. So um, the, the, the service feasibility matrix is effectively implicit to the, uh, the, class, uh, the class diagram and also the activity diagram. So uh, I guess this is a really good point in, to tell you that since I've gone through a good portion of the, of the theory, is that what the theory is really doing is providing a quantitative representation of what we're already familiar with in terms of SysML and, and, and UML. And so if you're already developing a lot of models in UML or in SysML as part of your um, uh, engineering, uh, software engineering, systems engineering activities, then the translation to the heterofunctional graph theory it should be fairly straightforward. So if you put it all together, what you'll end up finding is that the, uh, the system, uh, the heterofunctional adjacency matrix that shows the relationship between these capabilities or degrees of freedom sits at the heart of it. And we will also have a uh, controller adjacency matrix, which shows the relationship or the communication links between the various uh, controllers. Um, we will also have this A row C here, which is really um, uh, a, it's not, it, it has the same meaning as the controller system agency matrix, but it, it uh, needs to take into account sort of uh, index counting and, uh, and so forth. We derive the, the formula for that in, in the book. Um, and, uh, and then up here, we have the collection of all the service graph adjacency matrices for all the different services. And then we have this AL row, which shows the feasibility of the services to the underlying structural degrees of freedom in, in the physical system. So what does this end up looking like? Again, we take this, uh, we take this fairly simple uh, example. We developed our heterofunctional adjacency matrix in terms of its structural degrees of freedom and the sequences between it. We introduced our cyber, um, 
uh, our cyber resources and the connections between them, as well as the agency that they have over these different nodes. Um, and then we also have um, uh, uh, the service graphs for, for water, electricity, and, um, and the, the, uh, the electric vehicles. And then and those are going to have feasibility linking up to, again, each of these structural degrees of freedom. And so you can sort of put all of that together. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing OK. Yeah. So, um, so really what I want to do quickly here is, is show you that if you follow all of that math, you could actually apply it to uh, a a much larger system, and uh, like this one here, where we have you know a full water distribution system and a full electric power system and and a full electrified transportation system, and you know you have all of these different types of resources and their their various classes and uh, and and their associated processes, and probably the the, the first thing that um, uh, here are just the, sort of the statistics on each of these different examples. Uh, each of these different infrastructure layers. The, the very first thing that you're going to have to do is map all of these different types of uh, resources onto the, the meta architecture of the, uh, of the smart city and um, recognizing that each of the individual layers already does so. And so there, there's a certain level of uh, classification work that you need to do and, and take into account the, uh, the intersections of various, uh, various classes. But um, I'm going to jump, th but ultimately, you'll get something that looks like this, <coughs> where all the different types of resources are being mapped back to our smart city infrastructure uh, system uh, and its meta architecture. We have the heterofunctional graph theory, um, functional meta architecture, but we have to uh, apply a whole bunch of different uh, constraints to take into account that um, the, the flow of power or water or electric vehicles uh, doesn't just follow any rule, but rather laws of physics or as we, as we know them. And what we end up coming up with is an activity diagram f in general for the smart city as a whole. And then we can start developing the uh, finding all of the st structural degrees of freedom. Here we've more or less placed them uh, you know, in a GIS uh, consistent way for water, power, and transportation. And then you can sort of put them all together. And, um, and then we apply those two different types of constraints, the physical continuity constraints, as well as the, the, those coming from the functional reference architecture. And we will get something that looks like this, which is a little bit difficult to understand until I look, make it look like layers. And what we will, um, or I'll visualize it with layers. We have our transportation topology, our electric power topology, and our potable water topology. And uh, interestingly, there's a charging topology, as you might have expected, and there's also electric potable water topology, and then there are links between these five layers. We view it as five layers, not three. We also recognize our cyber controllers and the agency that they have over their physical re resources capabilities. And we also um, will allow for these cy cyber resources to all communicate with, uh, with each other. And we identify also the services. And they will appear down here and that these services have uh, will be linked to their capabilities here in the physical, uh, physical system. And what we get in the end is something that looks like this. We have our, our physical system with all of its uh, capabilities or structural degrees of freedom. We have uh, their cyber resources sitting on top. Um, and we have the, the, these service graphs which represent the, the operands and, and their ability to change uh, change state. And uh, most of the engineering systems that we see um, uh, fit within this, you know, very interesting, uh, very interesting structure. I would like to conclude that um, we haven't just done this for interdependent smart city infrastructures. Uh, I, I've been working on this area for some time. 
Uh, it started out with mass customized production systems, which was originally my doctoral uh, work, multimodal transportation systems, electric power, multimodal electrified transportation systems, microgrid enabled production systems. Uh, Professor Ernest Cayal at the Geisel School of Medicine uh, has apply, applied this to uh, personalized healthcare delivery systems. And what can you do it with this once you have uh, the, the models in place? Well, you can, uh, it certainly serves to uh, develop reference architectures, calculate life cycle properties like resilience, um, and, um, and it actually facilitates the development of dynamic simulations. Um, our, for example, our uh, electrified transportation system simulator that we used for the Abu Dhabi electric vehicle integration study uh, started from a heterofunctional graph theory model. So um, there's, uh, there's still a lot left to do. We, we, I think we've uh, uh, made a, an interesting contribution to uh, the network science and graph theory uh, fields. Um, and, um, but we're looking for more application domains and then applying um, the, the very rich body of literature and mathematics uh, that traditional graph theory has to this work, which at the end still produces adjacency matrices that we're familiar with. Yeah. So let me throw the floor open to questions. Yeah. Is any of this being used in, uh, in Toronto right now, where they're doing the uh, sidewalk project? I'm sorry? What, you know, what is being used in Toronto? Any of your theories right now? I have not had the chance to work with uh, our uh, brethren to the north. So, um, Bravo. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. So when I think about smart cities or virtually any sensor-enabled infrastructure, you know, a large part of that is coming up with methods to optimize something. Mm -hmm. How would that fit into the general theory that you're proposing to model these systems? Um, yeah, so, um, uh, the, the, well, with any optimization problem, we always, ha we always have to ask, um, you know, what's the objective function, what are the constraints, um, and are you optimizing the behavior of the system or the, or the structure? But um, uh, uh, as you know, the, the broad field of uh, operations research has done so much with, uh, with graphs, right? And um, and uh, th this is something that we're actually actively working on right now. Uh, how can we use heterofunctional graph theory to optimize um, uh, the behavior of the system, but also to optimize the, the structure of, uh, of a system as well? And, and both can act as uh, decision variables. And then, of course, you can design the objective function the way you'd like. I mean, part of what, what I'm asking is, you know, oftentimes these subsystems are owned and operated by different entities. Sure. And we know very well that, and you know very well that, optimizing things locally for each of the subsystems may actually lead to infeasible solutions across the global system as a sure. whole. Or, at worst, it would lead to infeasible solutions, and at best, it would lead to suboptimal ones. Mm -hmm. And so, part of you know, what I'm thinking as you were speaking, what I was thinking <coughs> as you were speaking, is that we need to sort of think of ways by which the different subsystems can communicate mm -hmm. through perhaps shared variables that enable these global optimization problems to be solved. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. Um, we, we haven't written a pa paper on this yet, but um, something that uh, I've been talking about with, with Steffi in the, in the con context of uh, transactive energy, um, One of the really interesting things about heterofunctional graph theory is, let's just use it here. One of the very interesting things about heterofunctional graph theory is that it introduces these nodes, black nodes here, that represent the transportation of a given operand. And you don't see that in a traditional graph. The, the nodes are you know, fixed into a certain location, usually. Um, if, if you were to look at uh, the, uh, the distributed control algorithms for optimal power flow in electric power systems, uh, they, they do this really interesting thing. They, they say, 
we're going to introduce quote unquote fictitious bus buses um, between the actual substation buses, right? And I, you know, I, I was I was reading it. And I was like, well, well, that's that's really interesting. That would be equivalent to the heterofunctional graph model, right? Um, and um, and so I'm I, I'm actually very interested in in pursuing this area. Fortunately, we we have a project with Irving for looking at uh, transactive energy and distributed control of electric power systems. Um, but but I, I think that this is actually a really interesting uh, area of um, trying to find global optima to things like you know optimal power flow uh, using heterofunctional graphs. So the literature spoken something about it, but I didn't know it was being called this or or vice versa. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if not, please join me in thanking Amro again.